I want to tell you about something I really believe in, which is nutrition. On my show, I get to talk to specialists throughout the entire health universe, chiropractors, herbalists, naturopaths, mental and emotional health coaches, and licensed healthcare providers. Amazing pieces to the puzzle we call health. All of these, of course, are supposing that you're actually eating. We, <laughs> we eat to get all the raw building blocks our body requires. And that's where the problem starts. There's no more food in our food, right? I think everyone knows about the deficiencies in our soil that our food is grown in. Those deficiencies are passed down to us unless we can supplement. Which brings me to TakeYourSupplements.com. These people work with my go-to doctor, my go-to naturopath for all my supplements. I've used them for seven years. My family and I love them. They work. And if you'd love to address your nutrient deficiencies and figure out what supplements are right for you, then you definitely want to go to TakeYourSupplements.com. You put in your information and within 24 hours, one of their health coaches contact you and for free, will talk with you and figure out exactly what supplements are best for you, the highest quality for the lowest price that fit into your budget and address your nutrient needs. They're amazing coaches. I've known them for years. I love them. They're wonderful people. They have a huge heart and they really want to help you to dial in your supplements and your diet and your lifestyle to achieve your health goals. So go to TakeYourSupplements.com and put in your information now. That's TakeYourSupplements.com. You will be very happy you did. Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 226. Today is going to be an amazing interview. I absolutely love our next guest, and it's going to be totally different from anything we've ever done. So <laughs> strap your seatbelt in and get ready for Kenneth Gronbach, who is a demographer. And now you might be thinking, why on earth would we have a demographer on the show? Well, I heard Kenneth uh, on a, another podcast, and I thought, man, I want my listeners to learn exactly what he's teaching. Uh, now, Kenneth, you have an amazing book called The Age Curve, How to Profit from the Upcoming, or sorry, for, sorry from the Coming Demographic Storm, and your new book, yep. Upside, uh, Profiting from the Profound Demographic Shifts Ahead, and that was just released uh, in April of last year. Uh, you have this amazing knack for predicting shifts that occur uh, within our society and then them, them coming true. Don't you have something like an 80 or 90% success rate? Yeah. Well, in, in my book, the, the age curve, I made about a hundred forecasts. I got 80 of them right so far. Amazing. Yeah. Well, it blows me away too. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's, I, the reason why I wanted my listeners to have, to have you on the show is that it's so important for us to understand where we're, where we're going. Um, It'll it, like look at Blockbuster, and I remember loving the thrill of going on a Friday evening to Blockbuster and picking out your movies for the weekend. And look, they're belly up. I mean, it's 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 just amazing that something that I thought would be around forever. You know, they just announced this week that that Best Buy will stop selling CDs, and I thought, when was the last time I bought a CD? And yet, I growing up going to um going to the local music store, it was. It was the coolest thing to do. It was the cool, like you just thought CDs were going to be around forever. And I use these as examples because, you know, if you're in an industry which you think is serving the population, if the population shifts and all of a sudden you are no longer serving, an, you're no longer serving any customers, you're going to go belly up. Well, this, this plays a role in our health in our in our society and every part of our culture and economics and that's why I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Before we really dive into it though, uh Ken, I'd like you to start by sharing your story. What led you to become this uh, incredibly well-respected demographer? Uh it it was uh a, a trial by fire. I I came out of the uh, the advertising industry, marketing industry. I had an advertising uh, agency from 1979 to 1991 and in the in the 80s our signature client was American Honda motorcycles and we had 100 we represented 140 dealers in the northeast from the tip of Maine to Pittsburgh to Washington DC the the bikes uh, would be shipped from Japan 
uh, we put them in the dealerships. We run really cool ads uh, that were prepared for us. And we'd sell out, we'd sell bikes by the tens of thousands until 1986. It was, it was kind of a, a strange year. We, we uh, put the bikes in the dealerships. They were prepped. Uh, the, the Japanese always sent us 10% more than we sold the year before. And we always sold them out to the piece at asking price. It was no problem whatsoever. But in 1986, I got a call from American Honda, and they asked me if I ran the ads. And I said, yeah, I ran the ads. What's going on? And they said, well, it's like we don't have any uh, traffic in our dealerships. It was like somebody turned a faucet off. And I said, you got to be kidding me. And they said, no, but Kawasaki, Suzuki, and Yamaha have the, uh, the identical problem. Mm. Their dealers are all you know, flaking out too. Uh, and they said, what's going on? I said, boy, you got me. And they said, you want to hear another one? And I said, sure. What? <laughs> you know, that's, I don't want any more bad news. And they said, well, uh, this archaic thug of a bike that leaks oil called Harley Davidson is starting to sell. And it's technologically, it's no match for Honda, Kawasaki, Suzuki, or Yamaha, but they're selling like crazy. What the heck is this? What a strange market. So we tried everything. Uh, they, they, we got a lead contingent that came over from Japan studied the problem. They said the, the price of the Japanese bikes was too high, so we reduced the price by a third. Uh, we came up with new products. We developed scooters, uh, all kinds of uh, new and interesting things to sell, and nothing worked. By 1992, business for the Japanese brands fell 80%. And the, so we, we just did wholesale across the board there, closed the dealers. And we didn't, we didn't know why. I mean, in J Japan didn't know why that the high level advertising marketing company that we were in, uh, in working in tangent with didn't know why. No one knew why. So 1996, this is, uh, this is uh, four years later, I'm in my office and, and I'm reading a full page editorial in uh, our local, uh, you know, state newspaper called the Hartford Current. Uh, is that I lived in Connecticut and the, uh, the Hartford Current Full page editorial was indicting a, a whole generation. I don't know if you recall, but Generation X was born 1965 to 1984. And they were called slackers, lazy, couch potatoes, because they were not performing at the level of, of the boomers. And this was a whole page with confessions from Xers saying, yeah, we're lazy. And I'm thinking, this this is nonsense. This is not data. I mean, who? This is subjectivity. <laughs> somebody, somebody, somebody's weird here. So I, uh, I I called in our research department, which was one guy, and uh, and I said, uh, go find out everything you can about Generation X, born sixty five to eighty four. Everything. I want statistical abstract, Bureau of Labor Statistics. I want census data, CIA fact book, whatever you can find. I said I, I need to know why they have they're getting such a bad rap. And uh, he came back. At, at the end of the week with his report. And so I said, okay, let me have it. And he's, and I, I said, uh, uh, what about generation X? And he, and he said, uh, generation X will never perform at the level of the boomers. And I said, so they are lazy. And he said, no, Ken, there's just fewer of them. And, and it, it took, that took a minute to go in. And I said, what? He said, yeah, there's, there's, th there were fewer babies born 65 to 84 than there were 45 to 64. The boomers are, are bouncing off of 80 million and this new generation X was 69 million. He said, do the math. He said, if, if you wanted to compare their performances in anything, it would be like comparing a football team that was allowed to have nine players on the field and the other team was allowed to have 11. Who do you think would win? <laughs> so I, 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 it, it, I said, it's just simply numbers. He said, yeah. I said, I think we, we solved the issue with uh, motorcycle uh, sales. I said, because if the if Generation X is 11% smaller, 12, 11, 12% smaller critical mass size, uh, how, and what is the peak of the boomers compared to the trough, the, the bottom of uh, Generation X? And he said, that's a 25% free fall. I said 25% reduction in the size of a market will wipe out any market. I don't care who you are. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how good your marketing is, how good your product is. That will wipe it out. I said, we just solved the issue with motorcycles. 
I said, we knew we sold motorcycles to men 16 to 24. That was it, 16 to 24. 25, they generally sold the bike, bought a ring, got married, and they didn't take the death wish into a marriage. So I said, once the baby boomers exited that very narrow demo of 16 to 24, the baby boomers moved out of that category, moved out of that marketplace, it was over because the generation that came in behind them was too small to fit the footprint. And I said, that is awesome. I said, I wonder how many people know this. And, and my research guy said, as far as I could tell from looking at all the stuff I looked at, no one. And I said, the, the generation X had to do other stuff. Let, let's, let's take a look. Let's, let's go back to when they were born. And Generation X, again, the people born 1965 to 1984, shut down uh, maternity wards. They closed hospitals mm -hmm. because you didn't need, you didn't need them. They, the 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 baby boomers were producing way over four million babies a year, and and the Gen X dropped to three. What what the heck is that? So we we they not only did they close maternity wards, they closed 30 percent of the public schools. Was anybody talking about that? No, no one. You, you you won't find anything in in the news about it anywhere. So I, I said they closed thirty percent of the public schools. I said they shut down bicycle sales. They shut down toy sales. They shut down motorcycle sales. They shut down uh, Detroit. Detroit could not figure out why they couldn't sell the the same number of the highly profitable SUVs to this new generation X as they sold to the baby boomers, but nobody bothered to count them. <laughs> and then in in two thousand eight. Baby boomers are bumping up against retirement. Now, this is a, this is big picture. This is macro. This is 30,000 feet. Baby boomers are, are bumping up against retirement. They have their entire retirement in the equity in their homes. It's time to, they've already refinanced the starter castle two or three times. So it's time to get the equity out and move to Florida. And they did that in mass. And they turned around to the generation behind them and said, buy our home. And the generation behind them simply did not have enough people in it to buy the homes for every 10 mm. homes for sale there were eight buyers and over she went so it's it, it, can you see the math here this is this this is all this is is math mm -hmm. now currently the the, the people and, and I, I find it interesting that that probably the majority of the people that we're talking to are gen xers they're they're currently gen x right now is 34 to 53 years old it's a small generation. It's augmented. Now, do, uh, uh, maybe this is another question I have for you, would be, do you have Latino listeners? You know, I, I don't know. I, it, the, the demographics that I get from, um, you know, iTunes and, and, and the other podcast directories wouldn't break it up by that. I'm, um, I really don't, don't know. Uh, why would you ask? Because what happened was because Generation X was missing nine or 10 million people just in time for the, the baby boomers to demand services, labor was in a jam. Mm. Factories were in a jam. Everybody was in a jam. Truck drivers, we were like at, at the high point, I think a half a million truck drivers, uh, uh, less than our needs. So it sucked in immigration, immigrants from Mexico like a vacuum cleaner. And they came in and they, they, they took a lot of the entry level jobs. Latinos are amazing. I tell folks, like, go find a Latino, kiss them on the lips and thank you for coming. Uh, <laughs> because without Latinos, uh, we wouldn't be having enough babies right now for, to sustain our country and culture in 2050. So where the Latinos filled in was exactly where we needed them in the deficit of Generation X. If you looked at the, the lion's share of the Latinos in the United States, we have a huge block that are currently 34 to 53 years old. And the ones that stayed, according to Pew Research, are socioeconomically advancing, which is wonderful. I mean, culturally, they're a perfect match for our country. Unlike if you tried to compare what's happening, say, in France, where the indigenous folks didn't produce enough children, didn't have enough labor, and their labor came off of North Africa, but it came in a form of Muslim culture, which is antithetical to Western culture. So, it, you know, they have problems. Mm -hmm. We don't in the United States. We're in very, very good shape. So that's that's the basically what happened was was a, that was it was a discovery. Once I made the discovery, Ashley, once I understood the power of shifting demography, 
uh, this just just lit me off like a Roman candle, and I never looked back. I just so now I've been uh, 21 years into proprietary research. We've compared uh, our numbers with uh, uh, Dr. Nicholas Eberstadt is a PhD from Harvard, and he is the State Department demographer. And I, I saw some of his work. I gave him a call. Wonderful, wonderful man. And so we we. Uh, we met and we compared numbers and he said, you nailed it. He said, this, your numbers are the same as ours. He said, the only thing that we don't understand is marketing. There's no one in the state department that understands marketing. So you've combined demography and marketing, which is what it enables you to make the forecasts that you do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Cause you understand the industry, you understand the mechanisms of business and uh, and then and then now having this like understanding the population and as a as an entire as millions of people move towards something that you can clearly see or predict what their what their needs are going to be or what the demands on the industry are going to be. And it's so fascinating. These major companies, like you said, Detroit didn't see this coming. They didn't realize no. that there was a 25 percent less customers all of a sudden in their demographic. Yeah. And, and it just blows my mind. And you, and you saw it. How cool is that? It's like you read the matrix. Well, and, and the interesting part about it, I would watch, uh, I watch a lot of TV. I'll, I'll admit that. Uh, and it, because they study the commercials and in the mass media, and we could talk about that later, but mass media is going away. But I'm watching um, uh, Chrysler, Ford, and Chevy. I'm watching them get frustrated in their marketing. And, and then I'm reading things about the news in the news about how they keep on firing their advertising agency because the advertising agency is not saying the right message to this new generation X to make them buy just as many SUVs as the baby boomers. And I'm thinking, you jerks, there's fewer people in that market. What do you mm -hmm. think is going to happen? Hey, you want another one? Here's one for you. Crime. This is uh, this. I always get a kick out of this. Uh, crime uh, actually is committed by men, not women. Women are 10 times less likely to be a criminal than a man. 10 times. Isn't that incredible? Amazing. Yeah. You want to you want to hire a CEO? Hire a woman. <laughs> wow. Not a CEO. Not, not a, not, uh, uh, I mean, a CFO. Yeah. She's 10 times less li less likely to cook the books than a man. Anyway, uh, criminal activity. If Crime is committed by men and not women. And crime is committed by men 15 to 30. They commit uh, a, a Bureau of Labor statistic, good numbers, 60, 70% of crime. So if you have a smaller crop of 15 to 30 year olds, guess what happens to crime? The crime goes down. down. Yeah. And who takes credit for it? All the mayors, all the police <laughs> forces, all, all the, the governors, Donald Trump. <laughs> And, and the, the bottom line is there's just fewer potential crime committers. So you said age 15 to 30. Wouldn't that be then millennials? Well, that's millennials now. Yeah. OK. So 15, but, but back then when it when Generation X was moving through age 15 to 30, um, crime dropped. It, the crime crime rate went down. So that was what that was between um, like the. Early, late late seventies, early eighties. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And crime and crime has spiked, and and in fact, that's when we put into place the, the you know the war on drugs, which filled up our prisons. Mm. So, but now uh, the the millennials are uh, committing crime, and and crime is going up. But we, we seem to be rating it differently, or something. But certainly, uh, we have an issue now with crime, and that's not going to go away. So, and now what millennials are now, and I, and I, I only know this because of what you said in the other interview I heard you say, but the, the, the millennial population, is it larger than the boomers? Yep. It's, it's so, larger than the, by the, in, larger than the boomers by at least a couple of birth years, which and, means that there's 86 million of them. It's the largest generation ever born in the United States. They were born 2015, uh, uh, 1985 to 2004. 1985 to 2004. Okay. Got it. And so, so I, I, I imagine I have, I have some millennials, but I think most of my demographic is, is gen X. I mean that, that listens to the show. Um, 
it's funny when you, when we first got on Skype, you asked me that you said, what's, you know, what's your demographic? And I said, I'm pretty sure we've got, you know, I, I'm sure we got some 20 year olds, but we've got like, you know, mid, mid thirties or thirties all the way up to the fifties. And you said, okay, you've got the smallest generation. Yeah. And you're, th- you're and, and the irony of that is your, your particular audience can't do anything but grow. Right. There you go. Wait a few years and all the millennials will want to listen to my show. That'll be great. I'll have oh, lots of episodes it, for them. <laughs> you you won't need to wait a few years. They're already what's happening is remember millennials, generation Y, born 1985 to 2004, are 14 to 33 years old. On the front end, on the high end, the old end, they're starting households mm-hmm. and getting married. Now they're getting married late. They're getting married two, three years later than than the, the generation before them. But that was because they couldn't leave home because they were not welcomed into the labor force. A lot of them coming out of college had 50% unemployment. But now boomers are, and, and why was that? That was because boomers were not leaving the labor force because they couldn't afford to. Mm-hmm. But now they can. Now, now things have turned around. Boomers are finally, boomers are currently uh, 54 to 73. Uh, they're retiring a little bit late. We're, you know, I'm in South Florida. You should, you should see it down here. You should, you, you, we don't go out during the day because you can't get from point A to point B because of the traffic. Wow. So it, it's, and Florida's population is going to go from 20 million to 30 million and Florida is not prepared for it. And I've been telling their legislators, I've been telling their county supervisors, guys, you have to build affordable housing. Or you're going to be in a jam here pretty quick because there's a tsunami of people headed your way called the baby boomers. No kidding. Oh yeah. Wow. I'm just, I'm so you said that the, it was the boomers. And then when it went to gen X was 25% less when it went to millennials, what percentage more did it kick up? I don't know what to do the math. It's, it's a, a couple of birth years. Uh, I, I, I don't have the, the, the percentage off the top of my head, but the, the, the boomers were about 78 million. So, and the, their kids are 86. So oh, wow. it's, 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 it's 8 million more. Got it. And in light of the fact that we produce about 4 million babies a year, it's like t- an extra two years of babies. And it's, it's very healthy. Listen, we're the only world power and the only industrialized nation that that's had kids above replacement level fertility. Mm-hmm. We, we've had kids now we're in a lull now, which is why are you watching what's happening with toys R us? Yeah. They're, they're, they're closing stores. Yeah, you know, you know what their president said? It's funny because, you know, one of their biggest products was uh, Barbie. Mm-hmm. And he said that uh, Barbie has lost her relevance in the age of, uh, uh, you know, digital phones, you know, uh, devices. And and I, I'm, I'm listening to him and I'm saying, no, she hasn't lost her relevance. She's lost her audience. They weren't born. People who buy... Uh, products. I said, it, people in Toys R Us, did, did you, do you ever go to a, a, a grade school and look at grade schools where the population of the grade school is literally gone from 500 to 300? You wonder what happened to those 200? Mm-hmm. And they said, well, they left. No, they didn't leave. They weren't born. Right. So that's what, we're, that's what we're experiencing now. But what what's right on the horizon, Ashley, is a fertility that I, I think is going to change things completely. And that is going to be the millennials are going, they're getting, they're just now getting, you know, loading up uh, the, filling up the venues for uh, receptions for uh, weddings. Try, try to get married now and you're going to wait a couple of years before a a good venue, at least two years. And so they're going to get married and I believe they're going to have children because they really are a kinder, gentler generation. They're nice. Let's talk a little bit about that because because what you, what what you're saying because millennials are the now the largest uh population the largest um group cohort of people moving through society age uh, fourteen to thirty three so all of their basically all the needs of anyone from age fourteen to thirty three are going up tremendously and so um mm. what do you predict? that the millennials, the choices, the health choices the millennials are going to make 
um, that's going to impact the the health industry both holistically and and also allopathic. Allopathically being like MD medicine and drugs and hospitals. I'm seeing that that millennials prefer uh, cleaner food, organic. That they're they're more inclined to buy GMO free. That they're more inclined to want to eat. Um, uh, responsibly sourced, uh, animal products. Like I'm seeing that and I'm wondering, are they going to, are they going to make so many of these choices that they're going to put these old industries, like the old farming, old agriculture out of business, or at least shift it significantly? They're going to shift it significantly. You want to, the best example I could think of is McDonald's. The, uh, you know, if my kids, I, I have two girls, one's 22, one's 25. So they're already, trust me, young women with their own minds. <laughs> uh, and, and I think they're mad at me because we used to take them to McDonald's. And I, I used to really sweat that they would discover that a McDonald's hamburger actually came from a cow. Because if, if they knew that, they wouldn't have eaten it. And so, uh, and, and you were warned up front that, that, that uh, you know, I'm, I'm a carnivore. So <laughs> forgive me here. <laughs> yeah. So, so we, well, I think what what you're going to see, I, I think the this is going to be uh, the age of holistic everything, because this is who they are. They, they absolutely positively, you know, they, I, I, I speak to farmers all the time and I say, guys, you got to deal with the GMO. You, you, you got to you got to do something and you got to do it post haste. And he said, well, if we don't do GMO, we never feed our population. I said, no, come on. Come on. Think again. Think again and come up with something different because they're you, they're going to force you to do that. The, the, the market is going to come your way. You have a generation of 86 million young people who are just now starting households and deciding what they're going to feed their children. And they and there are no more secrets. There are no more secrets. If you're hiding some nutritional issue, they're going to find it and it's going to hurt you if it's if it's bad news. Because I tell folks, uh, it, it, farmers, I said, you know what the, the, the three ends of, of food are going to be going forward? Nutrition, 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 because that's how these kids think. So get ready. It's happening. It's, it's, and, it's, and they are just now starting households they're just now starting to buy dish soap. They're just now starting to buy uh, food for at least two people. Maybe, you know, maybe they have a baby on the way, but it's just now starting. This is, this is, this is the time you want to get into a business, get, get in, get into the nutritional food business. Mm. So you want to serve the, the young family uh, oh, yeah. that's just having, that's just having children. Um, because that, that is the, the 85, do you say 85, 86 million people are going to yes. move through the, the needs of a, the, the young parents basically. Exactly. So becoming a midwife, a doula, having a birthing center, um, those are going to be booming for, for the next over, over 10 years. Precisely. Everything, everything is going to change. Keep in mind, too, that it, with the, the generation that is 34 to 53, uh, you know, your tiny Gen X, your, your Gen X population is augmented by Latinos. And, and Latinos naturally, then they're granted that they're, they're, they have some bad habits when it comes to food. And, and I'm not speaking as an authority, but they buy, they visit uh, or they shop twice as often because that's what their culture does. And they buy fresh. So that could that could be a whole new market too, if assuming that, you know, uh, it, they get educated to what good food is. Well, and I know that Latinos are sick of having diabetes. That that it's um that diabetes oh, yeah. is 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 um higher in in certain uh, sure. cultures, and that you know I've just heard many times from different doctors that um that diabetes in in is really a big problem in Mexico and also in India. 
um, whether it's because their food is vo or the, the food that's grown in the soil of their countries might be void of certain micronutrients like the trace minerals, chromium and vanadium, um, or whether, you know, they're, they're leaning more towards saturated fats and fried foods. Who, who knows? Um, there's so many variations that, that lead to diabetes, but, um, diabetes care and also reversing diabetes naturally, um, if, if you're saying that there's just such a large population or growing population of Latinos, because we created that gap, that the, the generation X between the boomers and the millennials, we created, um, you know, between 1965 and 84, we created this gap in the, in the labor force where we needed them to come in is what you're saying. We created a void and it, it's it. And so that that's why they, they came in. It's funny how people will say, they took our jobs from us. And it's like, no, we, we needed, no. we, we, those jobs were there and we needed a labor force ready because the people that were born 65 to 84, there was 25% less. And so they, uh, they we needed basically to, um, supplement the population by 25% to, to keep, you know, to keep those entry level positions, uh, functioning. Is that, is that what you're saying? Absolutely, precisely, and and the other factor is the the demands so be, between 1925 and 1944. We produced a tiny generation called the Silent Generation. There were only 50 million of them, and these are essentially Gen X's parents. the The interesting thing about this group was they followed in the footsteps of the generation that uh, was born before them, which is called the GI generation, born 1905 to 1924. GI generation is the generation that fought in World War II. It was a huge generation of about 70 million. Uh, it, at, you know, 70 million was a large generation at that time, but following them was a tiny generation. And so the, the needs and demands of the silent generation born 25 to 44 was small. And then along come the boomers who go into the uh, age into uh, the demo where they demand more services and you even needed more labor from generation X. So that's, you combine that with one, the fact that the generation is diminutive and two, that we needed more, not less that sucked in immig immigrants from Mexico, uh, like a vacuum cleaner. Yeah, it was, but it was good. It, it, and it, do you know that in 2007, we broke the uh, the live birth record in the United States. It was set in 1957 with 4,300,000 boomers. The the record was broken in 2007 uh, by it was 4,316,000 babies, 25% of which were Latinos. So I tell folks that, that, you know, that Latinos were critical, that they're a critical part of our population. They're, they're wonderful. And I, it, love them. I, I, I like that you're pointing this out because it's interesting, this idea of birth rate. I know a lot of people are saying, well, you know, we're, we're growing and we're going to take over this planet and we're, we're having too many babies. But but it's actually not the case. There's a lot of countries like Japan. I'm just thinking about off, off the top of my head that um, that they're, they're having such few babies that their yeah. culture is getting to the point of no return. So birth rates actually a really important thing if we want to you know continue the culture and, and continue um, progressing as a as a country. Can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah. Well, you know, I hear that. Whenever I hear anybody say, and and it, and it just it it makes me cringe. Um, we have to stop having kids. The world's going to get overpopulated. And I and I I look at these people and I say, how many people are in the world? I don't know. Well, then how can you say that? I <laughs> uh, just, I look around, I see all these people and it seems like just the minorities are having all the babies. Well, that's, number one, that's not true. It's not true. And that's not true. I said, there are 7 billion people in the world. I said, do you know where they are? No. Do you want to? Yes. Okay. Well, here we go. There's 7 billion. Uh, there's 1 billion in the Americas from Alaska, Canada, United States, Mexico, Central and South America is 1 billion people. United States has 330 million. There's a, a billion people in the continent of Africa. It's 35 countries. It's lion's share of them are sub-Sahara. There are very few people in the Sahara Desert. There's a billion people 
if you start off in Portugal and go through the EU into Eastern Europe and Russia, it's a billion people, there are, there's almost no one in Siberia. If the population of Russia is closer to the EU, that's where it is. There's a billion, uh, uh, four billion people in Asia. There's, there's about one four or so in uh, India and one four or so in China. And then the rest of them are kind of spread around. That's where the 7 billion people are. Okay, so how do we feed 7 billion people? Well, that would be easy if we could distribute the food because we produce enough food to feed 14 billion people and we really? throw half of it away. Amazing. We don't have we don't we don't have a food problem. What we have is a distribution problem. Most of the um, the people that that uh, because there's a billion people in uh, poverty, there's a billion people that are starving, there's a billion people that are illiterate, and there's some crossover there. But for the most part, uh, the people that are starving live in countries where you can't distribute food because it's sold off by their government immediately, and they let the people starve. Mm. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. And a, a, a lot of that is happening in India and, and the continent of Africa. So what do I say about uh, people that think there's not enough people? What is going to happen is in, in 1964, there was this earth shattering thing happened that did, received no news. And that was when half of the women in the world dropped below replacement level fertility, which is 2.2 kids. What happened? Well, we just don't need as many kids. And, and I guess this is a degree of selfishness. Who knows? I, it, that's not what I, that's not me. I don't, I don't go into that, but, the half of the women in the world dropped below replacement level fertility in 1964, and it's never looked back. We are having fewer and fewer. The rate of growth of our population is dropping precipitously. We will probably go to about 10 or 12 billion by 2050, 2060, and then the population of the earth is going to begin to subside. The problem with that is the majority of the earth is market economies which rely on consumers. You take consumers out of the equation and you take the market economy out of the equation. So it's going to be an interesting place. I'll be dead. I won't care. <laughs> that so. is very interesting how, you know, and, and I was listening to the heavy metal summit, a bunch of holistic health practitioners and doctors who are seeing that there's a rise in heavy metal toxicity just did by day-to-day -day exposure that, Jet fuel, which you know flies overhead and we get sprayed on every day by jets flying overhead, by airplanes flying overhead, that jet fuel has lead in it and lead falls because it's heavy. And so they're seeing more and more lead um, toxicity, uh, aluminum toxicity, copper, uh, molybdenum. Uh, uh, there's just a whole, whole list of, of heavy metals, mercury, if anyone gets vaccines, which now they've upped the vaccines from eight to 70 doses. Um, and so when the flu shot, if someone gets a flu shot every year, they're getting huge amounts of aluminum, um, and then also thimerosal, which is mercury. So with all these heavy metals that it, it directly affects and inhibits, um, fertility. And now they're seeing the biggest spike in fertility issues that they've ever seen all these doctors have ever seen have you seen anything in your de uh, demographics um show that fertility issues that uh, being infertile or having fertil fertility problems it has become an issue yeah i have it but 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 not from your perspective and i find that fascinating because i i you just told me something that i had not considered and that's a problem. I need to consider that. I need to consider the effect of outside forces on fertility. But I'll tell you one of the, the outside forces that is affecting fertility dramatically is women are waiting mm -hmm. to get pregnant. And mm -hmm. the older you get, the harder it is to get pregnant. You follow me? Yeah, you got we get, we get less chances, but also well, as women, we want a career and we need to have a career. That's something that the um, this this the GI and the silent generations, the women didn't have to go into the workforce, right? Because um, we kind of set up our life so that so that women could stay home and and be homemakers for the most part, not all women, 
But then what happened in our economy that that it took it really took two incomes to support a family? When, when did that transition happen? It's that that's happened in the last 20, 30 years. You know, right. I watched that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so if you think about it, like I grew up where there's a lot of women I grew up with, you know, seeing a lot of the my mom's friends not needing to have jobs. And, and a lot of them did, too. It was it, that was when the transition was happening. But but really, it, it is a necessity. It's very difficult for a family these days to maintain the lifestyle they want and only have one income. For the most part, most families need both parents working. Well, the mom, when she's stressed out because she's building her career or working two jobs or whatever, wherever she is on the um, socioeconomic scale, um, the stress of that can greatly affect fertility. So also she's thinking, well, if I have a kid, I don't have maternity leave. So how long do I have to take off work? And then who's going to take care of the baby? And then I've got to pay for daycare, which I'm I pay for daycare and it's incredibly expensive. And we only do it part time. And that's another thing I wanted to bring up is um, so I have a kid that's about to be three and there is a crazy six month waiting list on every daycare in within a 30 minute drive of actually a 40 minute drive of my house. Every daycare has like a six month waiting list. And I thought, you know what? And then I read some, something that said that in my county that there was there were 800 new students about to enter grade uh, the first grade um and that it was this giant spike and they weren't even ready for it and they weren't really looking at the 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 demographics to to see that there's this big influx so is it possible that that the this is the part of the early um baby or sorry the millennials the those 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 early 30s millennials having kids um and and I'm starting to see the stress that they're putting on um, the daycares and the the school system. It's the first I've heard of it, but I, but I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd have to believe that that could be a factor. That's very interesting. I had heard that you see where I live in the Northeast that the daycare is plentiful. In fact, the, the daycare organizations are going out of business. Wow. So I, I'm wondering if that's I wonder if that's regional. Maybe. Sure. It, it it yeah it could be, and and that's not if, and if it's regional it's not macro enough for, you know to make any to to to, to uh, draw any conclusions. Right. Well, yeah, that, I, that makes sense yeah. to look at to look at regional because in in my region there's a lot of immigration uh work a lot of I immigrants get have, find work here. Um, because my, I, we've got Microsoft, uh, Nordstrom, you know, we've got a major UPS, um, center here. We have Boeing. Um, I know I'm, I'm thinking Amazon, there's a bunch of others like Seattle has so many giant companies that are very happy to bring fam new families in. Um, so that, that also might be a reason why locally, but, I, but I imagine though, as the millennials, as these early thirties, millennials start to have children in a few years, there's going to be this giant stress on the daycare system, for example, on pediatricians, on um, more holistic pediatricians thinking about like, because a lot of these uh, millennials are probably going to choose not to vaccinate or choose an alt some kind of altered schedule, want to go to more of a holistic doctor. What other, sure. maybe if you could talk about, uh, because you've got your book, The Age Curve, How to Profit from the Upcoming Demographic Storm, why don't you let us know what are the, some of the things you're predicting that's uh, coming ahead as the millennials, um, you know, move through their um, their 30, their 20s and 30s? Well, we're going we're gonna to do big math here. Stay, okay. So stay with me, okay? Okay, there, there are 330 million people in the United States. Uh, 10 million of them are illegals. Demographers count the illegals because they're here and because we don't pass judgment. We just, that's, that's, that's not a, that's, that's not what we do. 330. The, the number of housing units that are available in the United States is about 155 million. So do the math. You know, it's like a little over, you know, on average anyway, two or three people per household. The the two largest parts of our population in the United States are the baby boomers at approximately 80 million people and their baby boomer kids at about 86 million people. And so those uh, 
folks are living under one roof for the most part. Big picture, 30,000 feet macro, living under one roof. Remember now, the millennials, the Gen Y are 14 to 33. Uh, you have lots and lots of 20 year olds living at home. And they're just now being welcomed into the labor force, so they're moving out. And they're starting households and they're getting married. And they're getting married. And so if, if you wanted to get into a good business in some way, the the uh, uh, the wedding business, it, lots and lots. And 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 I you know I speak to a lot of food folks, and they and I'm telling them the packaging is going to change too. You're going to see single bananas wrapped. <laughs> Separate issue. The problem is, a lot of boomers one are refusing to die, and refusing to get old. <laughs> and 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 that's just the way it is. We're, we boomers are not their parents. I am not, uh, both of my parents are deceased. I am not in any way, I don't, I don't bear any resemblance to my parents when they were uh, at my age. Were, were, now, were any... your parents the silent generation or the GI generation? GI. Okay. Yeah, they're definitely GI. And they, they um, so boomers are retiring in place. What does that mean? They're not exiting houses. They're, they'll, they'll retire in place, and then they'll also, uh, you know, at some point, get a house in Florida. But there are, we're not freeing up any houses. It does, that, that factor, which, which was a factor for, for some time, the freeing up of houses for sale. Ask anybody in real estate, how's their inventory? And they'll tell you, we don't have any. And the mm -hmm. reason they don't have any is because we are, are you ready? 25 million housing units short of our needs unless we expect the millennials to sleep in tents. So housing is going to spike. I just got off the phone before I talked to you. I was speaking to people that are uh, in the logging industry and they said, we need to know what's going to happen with our business because we have two big issues. You know, one sales and the other one is we don't have enough employees. And I said, both of those issues are going to be solved for you. One, you, we're going to build 25 million houses. Do they use wood for houses? Yeah. Yes. I said, your biggest problem is going to be not being able to get it to them. And number two, labor, don't worry about, you know, I said, what about, the, well, we've heard that this, these Generation Y kids are no good, they're lazy. And I said, yeah, right. Do you think they're going to stay kids forever or do you think they're going to grow up and, and, and have to feed their families? Yeah, well, I guess they'll grow up. Well, that's precisely what, what the hippies did the hippies were sex drug and drugs and rock and roll and what happened to the hippies they became republicans <laughs> don't worry about that people are people so uh we're, you're going to see a housing spike and the housing spike is not going to look back it's going to be starting now right now and it's going to go for 20 years you mentioned so, gen y is that what comes after millennials no, the same. Gen Y and millennials are the same generation. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Got it. Um, they just okay. Yeah, that's right. I was thinking to myself. I thought Gen Y and Gen X were beside each other, so that's why they're, they're the same thing. Uh, yeah, the, yeah so millennials have a calling. really bad rap. Millennials got a like, they got a bad rap for being being lazy or stupid or attached to their iPhone. But you say they're a gentler kind of 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 a generation. To talk a little bit about their personality as a as a, a cohort of 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 86 million people well the, the things that come to mind i i don't think there's any question that uh everything that's happening with women now with respect to um you know having their bodies respected and uh not tolerating bad things done to them mm -hmm. uh that's that's precipitated by millennials and Gen Y, and that's that's who that's who testified against that that wacko doctor who's uh, you know that uh, who who did that to 250 young women. Incidentally, he's got about a year to live, maybe. If they put him in prison, he's dead. He's there are people that are are planning to take care of him now because oh, you don't go to. You, you don't go to prison with that kind of rap and, and make it. You can't. It's impossible. So uh, 
Yeah, they're they're kinder, gentler. They they uh, I I don't know whether I said this in the beginning of the interview, but I talked to my daughter, my 25 year old. Uh, sent me a text during the Super Bowl, and she said, "Dad, I don't want either team to lose." <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I said, "One of them has to. It's okay. You, you, you don't always win. You don't get trophies for showing up." <laughs> so, yeah, you know what? The the, the the bottom line is, Generation Y millennials are people. Once the financial umbilical is cut from their parents, and they have to make it on their own. It's amazing the kind of decisions that you that you have to make. Mm -hmm. You know, you you you. It, life is not a free ride. Life is working things out, working hard. But I think you're going to find that these kids are going to be infinitely more respectful of each other, men for women, and for minorities than any generation in history. Oh, I love hearing that. That's that's very very yeah. cool. Yeah. So your newest book, Upside, Profiting from the Profound Demographic Shifts Ahead, in relationship to health and healing and food and all the things that have to do with our holistic health, what kind of predictions um, would you uh, do you have either in your books or would you like to make? Well, here's something that, that you need to think about, because this is the other end of the, you know, let, let's go to the, to, to the boomers. Uh, I'm in Florida. And, and I, I've spoken to legislators, I've spoken to municipal employees, I've spoken to uh, groups that uh, uh, are, are the decision makers for Florida. And I, and I said, folks, the, the boomers, your population in Florida is 20 million. It's going to go to 30 million. And it's going to be the boomer generation. And they haven't come yet. They're they're, they're just now starting. They are just, we're seeing that we're seeing the front wave. It's going to be a tsunami and you're not prepared. And I said, it's going to be three categories of, of uh, commerce that you're not prepared for. One is healthcare. Mm -hmm. I said that the, uh, the last 72 hours of life, you use what 80% of the healthcare that you're going to use in your life. I don't know, something like that. I said, so I said, healthcare, elder care is going to be off the charts and people in, 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 and again, no more secrets, baby boomers are going to demand better food. They don't want to die in, in, a, in an elder care facility. They want to enjoy a health care, a healthy lifestyle in an elder care facility. So that's all going to influence you. The final one is not going to influence you, and that's death care, because we simply do not have enough crematoriums, uh, funeral homes, or cemeteries to bury the boomers, which is physically don't have the space. I don't know what's going to happen. Somebody's got to come up with a new plan. Walmart might. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, Cos yeah. Costco sells caskets. <laughs> yeah, I mean not not very well. I mean, no, of course they, not. Uh, they they uh, uh, there are lots and lots of people that are working on alternative measures. There there's actually mm -hmm. somebody who's found a way to freeze the body and turn it into powder that is ten percent of your body weight uh, that you can. Uh, grow a tree in and that would be kind of a nice I've thing seen that i've seen that video many times on facebook it gets shared around a lot um yeah. and i i think that that uh i bet the gen y i bet the millennials will choose that if their parents don't have a you know have a preference if the boomers don't have a preference i think millennials would go for that because you're planting a tree and that's you know very symbolic of the millennial generation wanting to Precisely. Green up the planet again. Let's go plant some trees. Well, do you know that that, that uh, cremation is a, a ecological disaster? First really? of all, it it it's uh, it uses enormous amounts of energy, and the and the environmental protection agencies just turn their back to what's being pumped into the air. Totally, mm -hmm. they, because you can't. It, it, what do you do with the bodies? But the amount of junk that's going into the air around a sure. crematorium, you don't want to be near one. That makes total sense because I mean it's not like it's not like a coal coal uh, energy plant where they have all kinds of buffers and filters um, on the exhaust and you know talk learning from all these doctors about heavy metals and amalgams and all you know all the toxins left in the body and what if that person before they died went through chemotherapy and their body's just filled with um, lots of toxins and then you burn them off and you breathe that in that's you definitely don't want that. Um, that's really interesting to point out. Yeah. We, we've, we've do, do have some form of dilemma when it comes to 
uh, healthfully dispose, I, I hate to use the word disposing, but disposing of 85 million bodies as the boomers pass on. Um, so that's, that's, that's really interesting um, that there's, there's some gaps in new industries yet to be created to support these populations. Yep. But now back, back to food, because, you know, you're, we, we carnivores tend to look at your audience as tree huggers. Would that be safe? <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, but, but, but it's, but that's going away, isn't it? Because there's less and less arbitrary considerations and more and more we're finding out more and and the way that education is going the way that secrets are being found out mm -hmm. works in your favor it works in the favor of people that have been saying all along you can't eat junk and live well you have to eat better it's you know my wife beats me up all the time <laughs> <laughs> well i mean and i um yeah i mean I, I i'm not like a vegan uh but i uh i've learned so much from the people i've interviewed i've had so many guests on the show talking about the health benefits of of choosing a cleaner source of protein and so my husband and i for january went uh meat meatless and we actually feel amazing. I was really, really surprised. But there's a whole way of, of figuring out how to get your protein more economically. So uh, legumes, for example, one cup of legumes is 18 grams of protein. And that was so much more economical than buying a steak or a chicken um, and also healthier. So there's there's ways in which to play around with it, uh, play around with food. So you don't have to go all the way to the vegan spectrum. Uh, but I see I see these millennials going that route. It's funny looking at I was always surprised at how well Whole Foods did, how well Whole Foods is doing. But since I moved to the States in 2006, watching Whole Foods grow and, and expand, I was living in Las Vegas at the time and I watched them build a new Whole Foods and I saw how popular it was. And then be, now I'm living here just outside of Seattle and I've already watched uh, three Whole Foods be built since I moved here. And they're just, they're so popular. And I'm, I thought this is so cool that people are going this route. And this, the, the, the buyers, I mean, that, that wasn't even the millennials buying for the most part. That was the boomers and the Gen X. And now the millennials are coming in and they're going to make even better health choices. And they're going to really vote with their fork and, and make these major shifts. Um, so that's, that's really cool to see. Is there anything else that you, um, before we move on to the next topic, is there anything else you wanted to, to, to let us know in terms of what you see happening uh, in the next 20 years uh, that, that we should be aware of, especially those listeners who are uh, ho holistic health practitioners? Well, I, I'll give you one more, only because this is something that is brought to my attention by uh, this group of scientists that I've spoken to a couple of times that, that uh, are, are working on getting FDA approval for you know, new medicines. Uh, they claim, and it's it's called single dose. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it, it's they they literally, if you had like a a, a tumor on your liver, uh, they would take all kinds of information from your body, and they would develop a something, mm -hmm. uh, some kind of a liquid, some kind of a a serum that would only go after that particular problem that you have, and mm -hmm. it would eradicate it, and it would be no side effects. Now, and I'm thinking, whoa, that's that's pretty incredible. And I said, is that that sounds like something that's often, you know, that that it doesn't that, that doesn't sound real. And and they said, listen, we're we're coming up on a time when the we you will have people easily living to be 120. Mm -hmm. And they said, once all the pharmacies, there's an awful lot of stuff that uh, is just now. Uh, getting FDA approved, and we're going to live a lot longer. And that's going to change our culture. That's mm -hmm. going to change everything. And it will increase our population. And, we'll, and that will increase the population of the world. Hey, do you know what, what the, the, the single biggest ingredient was in increasing the population of the world from 1 billion to 7? You know what it was? 
I'm going to guess something to do with being able to transport, like transport food, transport goods easy, uh, in a more easy, easier fashion. Well, it actually, that, that's, that's partially correct. It's true. Uh, it was corn and potatoes. We, in, in the 16, 17, 1800s, we started bringing in corn and potatoes from South America to the EU. And you could, uh, it transported well. It was very easy to cultivate. And the most importantly is you could store it, which is not something that they could do before. They couldn't store their food. So people didn't live very long. But once people that were not, you know, were no longer starving to death, they lived longer. Corn and potatoes. That's very H interesting. Hate to, hate to say it. Yeah. That, and that happened. The spike uh, uh, is fairly recent. So. Well, and that, that corn and potatoes was GMO free. So I'm okay with that. <laughs> there you go yeah it right had to be. so uh, we have a facebook group it's called learn true health anyone is welcome to come join it all the listeners are welcome to come join it and um just search learn true health on facebook and join the group or go to learn com slash group it'll redirect you there and i i often post in advance what guests i'm having on the show in case any listeners want to chime in and ask questions themselves and my dear friend Forrest, who's incredibly, is one of the most intelligent people I know, um, is has always been interested in demography, and 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 he got excited, and he he has some questions for you, so I'll I'll I'll, I'll pose them now. He says, if you could ask about the demographics of Houston and Florida, what are the needs of Latinos that are here to stay? Also, what does he think will happen to Europe, Russia, Japan, China as their birth rate continues to sink? So I know there was a there was a few questions in there, so. Houston's about to become a mega city, and I we've already discussed Florida, so we don't have to discuss Florida anymore. But Houston is about to become a mega city, isn't that correct? Yeah, and, and believe it or not, what's driving Houston will be the millennials, Gen Y. Why? They're, they're flocking why is that? There. Why are you? Why, yeah, why are why are people why are the millennials flocking to Houston particularly? Quality of life, cost of living, and jobs. Oh, interesting. Very interesting. And then yeah, plenty. Of what uh, jobs? Oh, that I mean, that makes total sense because that's exactly what we're looking for. The millennials are looking for jobs and looking for housing, and and so you're saying that that Houston grew fast enough. Yeah, it's they anticipated uh, affordable housing. You can buy. I don't know whether you watched. There's some of these you know uh, shows on TV that uh, where they fix up houses in yeah. in, uh, in Texas. And the houses sell for around two hundred grand. Oh my gosh! Yeah, well, you know, if you if you, you well look where you are, you can't buy a house for a million bucks, and it's just, and it's the same way in the Northeast. It, 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 in Northeast, it, it, they're five or six hundred thousand for for you know a big house. Yeah. In Texas, you can afford to live. So the millennials, I I, I am, we're losing family members who say we're going to Texas. Texas is where it's happening. That's where, you know. It, it, the individual I was talking to said she can be transferred by her company, which happens to be Home Depot, and go work in Texas. And she and and uh, it's just so much cheaper to live there. Wow! And the quality of life is fine. I have a it's friend in, in in Houston right now, and she's uh for she's lived there for the last few months. She's in she's she's sick. She's getting better. She moved there from Seattle and she says the healthcare there is outstanding. She doesn't like have the best insurance or anything. It's, it's just, it's night and day difference. So she's getting far superior healthcare in Houston than she ever was in Seattle. And I thought that was really interesting. So they, yes. they, they, and that, and they a, planned out the, the infrastructure is what you're saying. Yes, they have. And if you took, uh, the babies that were born in Texas and, and combine them with the babies that are born in California, you would have 25% of the babies of the United States. Wow. And what generation is that? So what's, what comes after millennials? Z. And so Z is Z from Gen Z. Gen Z. 2004 to now. It, it, yeah. It's a, Gen Z is 2005 to 2024. Sorry. 2005 not, to, to, to 2000. To, 20, 20 24 goes all the way to 24. Okay. Yeah. And after that will be, uh, after 25 will be the baby blenders. We're all going to be the same color, but we'll be slightly darker. Well, that means we'll just all look really gorgeous and t you know, tanning, oh, tanning salons will be out of business. <laughs> exactly. You, you, you want to, you know, it's one of the interesting things, just a little aside, watch TV commercials. Now they're showing mixed marriages. 
Yeah, the, I, my husband kept pointing that out. I don't see it. I'm from Canada, like I'm from Toronto, and that's I grew up very multicultural. I just don't, I don't see it. In fact, I didn't like ever see like racism towards uh, African American or Black people until I moved here, and it really shook me because like I just never saw it. It just everyone's we're all just the same with different amounts of pigment. Like, and then I come here and it's like, whoa, like what is this racial tension thing? It's so well, weird to me. And it so it's interesting. I love that we're transitioning to, to more loving, accepting culture <laughs> is, what, is what you're describing. And that's Gen Y. And, and, and once the baby blenders are, are, are born, uh, yeah, you, you got to look out on an audience. I, I mean, I threaten some audiences because I, I actually will speak to an audience and have, you know, out of 500 people, I have two African Americans. So I asked the folks, I said, what is this, hunky heaven? I said, give me a break. I said, where are the African Americans? Where are the Latinos? I said, do you realize that that uh, in 2045, uh, we will no longer be a white nation? The, it's, it's just the minorities will have taken over. And that's a good thing. Why is it a good thing? Diversity, I, I don't know. I, I, I just, you know, I, I, I gave you some of my subjectivity there and maybe I shouldn't have, but I, I, I think it's just better that, uh, that we're, we, we lose this racial hatred. Mm. Just, yeah, and, and I think that a lot of the, what you're seeing now is, is a product of our leadership and it's it's just it's very short term. It's it's kind of anachronistic. It's kind of out of place in time. I I like that you said diversity because looking at the ecology of a system when uh when a system has diversity, meaning it has flexibility of behavior, it is able to survive um, unpredicted stressors. Whereas yeah. when an where an organism or when a system uh, does not have diversity. It, it, it could get completely wiped out and so yep. but by by an unpredictable unpredictable stressor and so so by us having more of a genetic diversity we we would also be able to have um, more flexibility behavior and, and thus survive the long term so i mean i'm that's just i'm just hypothesizing that um yeah so forest forest also asked about the birth rates how that are happening in russia europe japan and china and they're continuing to sink. What do you predict is going to happen over the next, you know, 50 to 100 years uh, as the, these birth rates in these regions sink? Their, their influence on the world, on the world's culture, will, will diminish. Uh, in 50, 2050, there will be no Japan. They can't. They, they, don't, they won't have any taxpayers. Somebody, I, I don't know, somebody will take over. Uh, somebody, you know, they'll just shut the lights out. <laughs> they're not having kids. They're not having relationships. They're they're substituting the internet for male female relationship. Uh, I I I am I love South Korea. South Korea has has probably the lowest fertility in Asia. No kids, no kids, no kids, no South Korea. It's over. If you don't have kids, you don't have, you don't have a country. You, you don't have consumers, taxpayer, or labor. Uh, China. China's missing between the ages of uh, under 40. They're missing a half billion people with this one child only policy. That was great. I mean, it worked. It was, it was a, a demographic dividend for that. It was like a dink, you know, dual income, no kids. Uh, but now they have, they've gone to a two child only policy, which means they're starting to crank out kids again. And they're, they're going to have a half billion elderly. How are they going to afford them? They don't have social security. They're, they're done. I, they, 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 these, these countries just simply shot themselves in the foot. India, India has 100 million more young men than they do women because they've killed the um, in, infanticide. They've killed the women because it's more favorable to have a son. I mean, what kind of a weird crap is that <laughs> didn't they do that in china too don't didn't they oh, yeah. heard horror oh, no, stories no, of of women giving birth to, to ba baby girls and then they just put the the baby it's girl in a bucket of water i mean i mean i'm sorry to say that it's so it's so horrific oh, no. but no, I, I listen i'll tell you a quick story I, i'm i'm in uh you know i live in airports because i speak everywhere and i'm sitting next to a woman and finally we just got so bored we started talking <laughs> and and i said um uh, where are you going? She said, well, I just got back from China. And I 
I said, oh, cool. I said, uh, um, she said, my husband and I were there. He's with IBM. He was working. And I said, did you work? And she said, no, I, I, I didn't have the appropriate visa to work. And I didn't, I didn't have to. So I volunteered in, a, uh, in an orphanage. Mm. And, and I said, oh, cool. But then and she, she didn't think it was cool. She just looked at me and I mean, we, this weird look. And I said, so what was your day like in the orphanage? And she said, well, in the morning, we go out and check the dumpsters for babies. <gasps> yeah, how about that? And I said, that, that's, that, that runs in tandem with everything that I, all my numbers and all the State Department numbers. You want another one? You, you, you want health care? Do you know that uh, I believe we do 30, 40,000 uh, organ transplants in the United States, which is pretty tricky stuff. Mm -hmm. and, um, and China does... Um, and, and latest numbers, I'm trying to maybe 10 or 15,000 organ transplants, but China has no uh, donor program. So where do they get the parts? And what and where they get the parts is, is if you go to prison in China, you get a physical and you become inventory. So it kind of keeps you from going to jail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, that's right. You know, I. People ask me all the time, why are you so hot on the United States? Why, why do you think the United States is the best place on earth? And I'm thinking because we have the best republic on the planet. The presidency is bigger than the president. The republic is bigger than the presidency. I think we're fine. I think we're going to, we're going to, we're riding over some bumps right now, but we're going to be okay. I'd hate, I, I'd hate to piss anyone off by asking this, but is there anything good that you see about the current presidency? Uh, my portfolio. <laughs> exactly. I, I am. Yeah. Hey, well, here, <laughs> let, me, let me finish. I'll, I'll be even worse. Okay. I'm partners in a hedge fund. And uh, our, our, we have a portfolio that uh, produced 50%. 50%. I mean, can you imagine? Wow. Not 5%. Not 0. 0.50. 50%. And because we combine my theories about what, things are hot and what things are not. And I have a, an absolute genius of a, of a partner who knows how to evaluate companies and off we go now. So, yeah, but is that enough to, to, um, you know, uh, support the division that's been inflicted on our country? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't want to go there. I, I, <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> Yeah. But it, but you know what it's everything is going to pass and and you've given us a lot of hope for what the millennials are going to do um you know in their lifetime. It sounds like the millennials are going to do a lot of good in their lifetime without even knowing it. Without yeah. even realizing the power they have, they will change the world. They will. My my uh, in writing my book this this latest book I'm I'm cranking you know I, writing is awful I hate it I'm writing you got to write sixty thousand words I'm cranking it out I'm writing I'm writing I'm writing and all of a sudden I hit a key on my computer and and everything went to, into symbols and I I went into uh, documents and everything was in symbols I like I I'm thinking did I just lose a ha you know six months worth of work I couldn't find it I couldn't I couldn't retrieve anything my daughter's walking up the stairs to our office. And she's texting on her phone and, and she's listening to music. Now she can text on her phone faster than the phone can accept it. <laughs> and she, and she, she walks around behind me, listening to music, texting on her phone, and a hand comes over my shoulder and she hit a few keys on my computer and all my work was back. And then she, she sat down at her computer. Uh, she brought up the internet and then she brought up somebody in Skype. She's texting on her phone and she's listening to music. She reached for the remote control, turned TV on. And I'm th thinking, I've raised an alien. <laughs> How in the world can she do f five things? And it was no trouble for her at all. <laughs> so that, that, that's who I think is, that, that's our heritage. That's who's coming. Very cool. Forrest had one more question. He wants to know, will nations uh, become competitive for smart bodies, meaning people who are highly educated immigrants from around the world, where there'll be some kind of competitive incentive um, where do you see that going where, where there's, because the birth rates are decreasing and we're in need of smart people in, in positions. So what does that look like moving forward? Probably looks like, um, 
1945 uh, with with the German scientists. <laughs> we fought over them, <laughs> and you know we took some, and Russia took some. That, that's that will always be an issue. I don't think that has really much to do with uh, uh, these times. Uh, I, I think we have plenty of population to su to support the basic things, but the really, really bright people, they will always be in demand and we will always compete for them. Very interesting. Now, in terms of your book, uh, The Age Curve, How to Profit from the Coming Demographic Storm, what tell us a bit about that book and, and who should read it? The per which, if you're going to read it, the, 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 my books, you should read The Age Curve first because The Age Curve is more comprehensive, more big picture. What we wanted to do with upside, profiting from the profound demographic shifts ahead, was uh, do a deep dive. And we broke the country down by state, by region, and said, this is what's going to happen. This is what's happening with your population. This is who your population is. And this is who your population is going to be. This is what your fertility is going to be. And this is essentially where people are going to go. It is the absolute, it, it should be the demographic Bible for uh, the next 10 years. And, and, and somebody always writes the Bible. And I think we're, we're the lucky people who have done it. That's it is well written. So cool. It is, yeah, it is. When we submitted it to the publisher, they gave us back their the uh, normal editing fee because they said it didn't need any edit editing. <laughs> Congratulations! How about that? Oh yeah, but this this is this is done in a this book upside is done in a very scholarly scholarly fashion, but by the age curve first because it, that will give you the perspective, and then this will give you the deep dive. Can you tell the audience, tell, tell the listeners some of the predictions that, because you said 80 out of over, you made like, what was it, 100 and something predictions and 80 of them have come true. Can you tell us some of the more profound predictions that you've made that have come true? Well, <laughs> one of them was, you know, the, the, uh, the age curve came out. Uh, right in the middle of the housing crisis, and and we knew the housing crisis was going to happen. What what kind of an advantage was that going to be? Uh, we we knew that, uh, for instance, the 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 funeral industry, death care, um, went into this incredible amalgamation in the 1990s thinking that the, the baby boomers were going to start to die in the year 2000. But the, for some reason, people didn't calculate one people living longer and two that, that most people can't count. And <laughs> it, it just destroyed that industry. Yeah. We knew going in that the automobile business was, was going to tank uh, because of uh, Gen Y, and and I, I can remember being at a school board meeting, uh, in, in in a brand new school, and and they said, uh, Mr. Grunbeck, you're you're a demographer. Do you have any comments you'd like to make? And I said, Yeah, you didn't need to build this school. <laughs> and man, you could have heard a pin drop in the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the 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 concept of um, uh food shopping on the part of uh, uh, baby boomers is going to be different, a different packaging the, the you know, the, the, the no secrets concept. I don't know. I, I could just go on and on and I'd probably be just repeating all the stuff that we've already talked about, but uh, the big one going forward is housing. There is going to be uh, one housing takes everything with it. A household takes dish soap, food, clothing, babies, Electricity. infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I talked to people who, who drilled horizontally uh, to put utilities underground. And they said, what's our future? And I said, it's, you're not going to be able to handle the demand. And, and that's pretty much, you know, uh, uh, things like that. Mm-hmm. Th things that, that are going to happen next. I'm seeing this big movement. I love watching these shows on YouTube. That's another thing you said that the m mainstream media is going away. The big media is going away. And I thought yeah. you, that's, I was thinking that the other day, I thought my son will grow up to not understand what it was like to wait for a TV show, 
and have to watch commercials in between because we watch YouTube videos of people that are just, they get their phone out and they make, they make their own show. They make their own content and we're so well connected. I love watching these families that live in vans and live in school buses. They convert the school bus into, they call it a schoolie, convert it into a home or they convert a van into a home, into an RV. And there's all kinds of millennials that are doing this now because, you know, you could do that for a few grand and then you've got a home and you could travel and you can have the freedom um, or or you can rent a little plot somewhere and it's significantly less expensive than renting an apartment or owning a home. And so this is, I'm seeing this become incredibly popular. Millions of views on these videos. Uh, have, have you heard of this? Yeah, what, what, what's happening is is ma mass media is history, and it's 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 going it's going very very micro, and, and uh, I love it. I think it's cool. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd rather watch shows that, and especially if I could fast forward through the commercials. Exactly. And I and I, and I, I used to be in the ad business. But the, <laughs> I, it, one of the one of the things that we forecast in in the age curve was was the end of. Um, mass media, but mass marketing is, is totally changed because radio, TV, and newspaper, you know, I, I, I read two newspapers every day and I'll open up to page three, which is normally an ad, a big ad, because that was where the big money was on page three and on page five, no ads. Why? Because the, the people that are selling stuff now don't reach their market through newspapers. They don't reach it through radio. They don't reach it through TV. There used to be, when you would watch TV, if, if there were eight commercial messages and eight commercial 30-second messages was four minutes in a half-hour program, uh, that was a lot. Now it's uh, like 16, 14, 16 minutes of commercials and 14 minutes of content. What the heck is that? That's history. It's over. We are changing. And mm -hmm. we are going to cars that are going to drive themselves. We're going to go to trucks that are going to drive themselves. The truck industry is still 200,000 truck drivers short of its needs. Now, I'd like to think that millennials are going to fill the bill there, but I kind of, I'm wondering. I don't know if they ever will. I, I don't, I don't know. What kind of jobs do you see the millennials gravitating towards if they won't fulfill the jobs that are needed to be fulfilled, like, like trucking? Well, you, you know, you just made me reverse my decision. What, what's going to, once the millennials are forced to provide for themselves, they will do whatever they, whatever it takes. So they're going to be in the building industry. They're going to be in the trucking industry. They're going to be in the, in the technical industry. They'll, they'll certainly be in, in the high tech industry, biotech. Oh, boy, you, you you want some stock advice? Biotech. <laughs> yeah, you had j briefly, I, I wanted to go back and talk about that. You, you had mentioned uh, that you were speaking to some scientists who say we can formulate a single dose. We can formulate a, a, a drug specifically for your g genes or specifically for your disease. I, I, I'm trying to get this doctor on my show, but he's, he's a little bit shy because he's come up against some, he's been sued by hospitals and by Swedish and he's gone through he's, the media here as he was uh, dragged through the media as being, um, a, 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 sh a shyster. And yet it came out that he was curing cancer left, right and center with every patient that came to him. Um, and that's why the, they went after him. That's why they, they, they challenged his license. He, he almost lost his license. He went bankrupt trying to fight them. Swedish Medical Center took out all kinds of ads saying that he was, you know, he was um, a fraud. And they really tried to, uh, I mean, this one doctor, so it's like, you know, David and Goliath, this one naturopath was doing so much good for curing cancer. And how dare he? That Swedish felt challenged, this giant you know, multi, multi million dollar, um, facility, uh, had to go after this one doctor. So what he was doing is he was working with a scientist in Boston who could take your, the genetics of your cancer and could formulate, uh, like this, uh, amino, uh, this amino acid complex that would attach to your cancer and make it completely inert. And it worked like a charm, but it cost about between 20 and $30,000, and it, he didn't get any of that money. It, that's how much it cost 
for the scientists to do the genetic coding of your cancer and, and formulate the, 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 the drug and then create the doses of the drug, but it worked and there's no side effects. So it, there, it is out there. There are these scientists who will do it. It's not FDA approved. If you get caught, as in as it, what happened was one of his patients had this tumor the size of a soccer ball in her breast and they they were told her it was in it was it was it had metastasized it was not pretty and she was going to swedish and the swedish doctor said basically go home to die we can't we've done everything we've thrown all the chemo at you there's nothing else we can do you know go home to die and um and so she went and saw this naturopath that she she paid the over twenty thousand dollars had this had this formula made it worked like a charm it was like the the tumor melted like a snowball on a hot stove she went back to Swedish, uh, walked right in to the oncologist's office, pulled up her shirt and said, you know, D what do you see now? And uh, and she was so pissed at this oncologist for basically telling her there are no other options. I've given you all the options. Go home to die. And uh, so she kind of confronted him with that. And he ended up, uh, you know, he, he became so infuriated. How dare a doctor who's not an oncologist cure your cancer and make me look like a fool and also challenge so Swedish actually has been developing has been working to develop this kind of technology and they felt so threatened by this that they did this entire slander campaign against this doctor and challenged his license and everything so if that she had just kept her mouth shut and not gone back to the oncologist he would have kept practicing this type of medicine um but it but that is the route we're going and he was a pioneer and and um that's the route that one day we'll be able to go in and have, you know, have a workup done and then it'll be more affordable for them to make a single dose, a, a, a pharmaceutical that is isolated specifically for, for targeting and curing the illness. None of this BS of taking, hopefully, hopefully none of this BS of taking drug after drug after drug with massive side effects. It's just chemicals. It's just harming the body. Hopefully the millennials will have enough of a pull as a generation to, to shift the, the, the way healthcare is going. So we both pr prevent, prevent disease. We practice preventive medicine beforehand, but also that we, we change the entire, um, drug industry. And I really, really, really hope that that is, uh, the, the amount of pull that we have, that we can change that, that giant industry that is just poisoning people instead of really, really uh, healing them like it could be. Well, like I said, there are, are no more secrets. So if it's if what you say is true, that will be found out. I love it. Excellent. Well, now your website yeah, yeah. is kgcdirect.com. What should our listeners know about your website? Um, do you, you you obviously you could be hired to be a speaker. It sounds mm -hmm. like you could be hired to be a consultant. Is there anything else that we should know about your website or, or what listeners should um, should pay attention to when going to your website, kgcdirect.com? They'll, they'll find out immediately that I'm a capitalist <laughs> and that I, I'm asking them to buy my books. And they, can buy, they can buy books and tapes and all kinds of stuff there. In addition, we, we do um, uh, research, which is based on uh, – uh, secondary findings. It's it's data that's already exists. We analyze it for specific industries or specific specific ge uh, geography, and uh, they can contact me relative to that, and and I can give them uh, an idea of how long it would take and how much it would cost. But that's basically it. The, the thing that what I what I do to pay the rent is is uh, speak, and I'm, I I have uh, I do conferences. Where I uh, I say uh, education inspiration uh, uh, and there's one more education inspiration Mo motivation <laughs> I, I no 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 ed ed education inspiration oh and entertainment okay Pick three <laughs> <laughs> I lost it I'm getting no tired no I get it I get it so so you educate you entertain and you inspire. Uh, and, uh, yep. and, and you, you motivate, I, I, I like to say motivate, but, um, but no, it would, if I had a conference, you'd be talking at it for sure. <laughs> I, I spoke, I spoke at a conference for a major German manufacturer of, of, uh, uh, automotive manu manufacturer. And after I spoke, the president gathered all his high level people together in a stand up meeting and they, and they, 
I was speaking to about 500 people, but he, he pulled all his top execs together and he said, you guys believe him? And everybody said, yeah, it's like you know, it's nuts and bolts, it's numbers. And he said, guess what? We're not building a plant in China, which was a multi-billion dollar decision. That sort of thing happens to me all the time. That's amazing. Because once, once people, once people, yeah, once people become aware of this, that uh, the, the power of shifting demography, uh, it, it changes commerce completely. It changes medicine. It changes food. It changes everything that we consume. It just it it just boggles my mind that these the the, the governments and major companies are not aware of this. Yeah, you wouldn't you think? That is no, that's fascinating. According to my yeah, my friend at the State Department said that uh, he just has such a hassle convincing people of these issues. Why isn't anybody going to Japan and saying, guys, you're done. You, you got to fix this. You're going to have to do immigrants. You can't be, you, you, you know, you, 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 you can't resist immigration because that's the only thing that's going to save your country, period. Mm -hmm. Will anybody tell them that? No. Anyway. So how Amazing. do we do? I think I think this is fantastic. What where do you see podcasting going? Do you see that with with um, Gen Y, the millennials? Do you sure. see them plugging into podcasting and listening to podcasts uh, it, more? Do you see podcasting just just increasing, or do you see it dying off? No, it's going to increase. Yay! Gonna, you're going to have in, <laughs> in, 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 in infinite more choices. So very but, cool. But but what what managers? to survive it's like a youtube video the ones that it, it, <laughs> the odd part about it is is it i'd like to think that the good ones survive but if you go to youtube and you look at my videos i have you know two or three thousand views but but the uh uh the, the baby that that coughs up or or is laughing because it's tickled is watched a million times so i don't know people have people are going to make choices you have to provide them with interesting subjects Absolutely. Well, I think your subjects are fascinating. And um, I, when I back in the 90s, I read the bu book Boom, Bust and Echo. And, um, and it, it blew my mind the this concept of like that they could predict, well, th that um, bird watching was going to be the number one sport. And it, when it went from tennis to golf to bird watching, as the baby boomers went from being 30 and 40 to 40 and 50 to 50 and 60. Of course, a, a six-year-old isn't it likely is is going to want to do something less stressful in their joints, like play golf, then play tennis, or go bird watching. And so the, the bo boomers were getting out there and were doing stuff, but they were just they were just where their money was going was different. So they were buying tennis rackets and rent, renting courts, you know, in the in the eighties and maybe into the nineties, and then you know nineties into the two thousands, lots and lots of golf. Still, still some golf now, but then bird watching then became big, and so it was like, and when I just when I wrapped my brain around that concept, I thought we could predict entire industries with demography, and that blew my mind. And then when I when I heard your talk, um, you were so accurate, and so you really take something that takes a lot of math and science, and you make it understandable because your background is in marketing and, and, and in business. So I love what you do, Ken. I think it's fantastic. The links to your books and your website are going to be in the show notes of today's podcast at LearnTrueHealth.com. Thank you so much for uh, sharing this information today. And if you ever, or uh, I, sh I shouldn't say if, when you come up with another book and you want a platform to, to share more about your predictions, um, please, you're welcome to come back on the show. Very cool. And thank you for having me. You're all right, Ashley. <laughs> you you too can <laughs> hello true health seeker i have a very exciting announcement i have spent over a year i've spent about 14 months collecting all of my information that i use with my clients for ending anxiety and i created an online program i'm very excited about it we just launched it and for you for free, I have a webinar where I teach you two powerful mind tricks for removing anxiety, ending worry, and controlling fear so it stops controlling you and your life. In my free webinar, you will learn what causes anxiety and how to stop it, the science behind the mind-body connection, 
overcoming fear of public speaking, getting unstuck, ending that fear of things not working out, ending procrastination and overwhelm, and feeling excited, grounded, and calm instead of fear and worry. I have so much to teach you in my free webinar, and I'm really excited for you to come check it out. Go to freeyouranxiety.com slash webinar. That's freeyouranxiety.com slash webinar. Or look in the show notes of today's podcast, and you'll see the link there so you can jump into the webinar and learn all these wonderful, powerful tools that will end your anxiety and create excitement and happiness instead. Go to freeyouranxiety.com slash webinar and sign up now, and I look forward to seeing you in the next live webinar.